still still around and will be around. So Hunter, let's go with it. Check. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, med students, for any of you who don't know me, I'm Hunter Rooks. I'm one of the fourth year uh, residents. Uh, I'm going to present this interesting case that I had on the General Surgery C service with Dr. Cochran. I'd like to thank him for allowing me to participate in this. So, uh, outline of this talk, we'll talk a little bit about our patient, how uh, he presented, a little bit about gallstone disease, um, a few varieties of uh, gallstone, gallbladder disease. Talk about gallstone ileus, um, how, what we did for our patient, and throughout the uh, talk, we'll have a little bit of uh, cost of medicine associated with uh, these disease processes. So our patient, 71-year-old male, really no significant past medical history, although he had not seen a physician in many years. Um, he had had an inguinal hernia repair in the past, denied any alcohol or tobacco use, but he presented with five days of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, did not have pain um, associated with after meals uh, prior to this. He was distended, uh, just very mildly tender, um, really no uh, specific right upper quadrant pain. Afebrile, hemodynamically appropriate. His white uh, blood cell count was a little bit elevated. Uh, and he had a uh, slightly elevated creatinine and bilirubin. So let's look at our imaging for him. So we'll scroll down, uh, note this, and we'll follow this along in the red arrow. So you start to see um, pneumobilia, this air in the biliary tree. As we scroll down, you'll see this yellow arrow is pointing at the gallbladder. As we come down, and you know the red arrow here is pointing at a uh, connection between the two. Continue to scroll down in the abdomen, and pay attention here as you start to see this object appear. It appears calcified. Get another look at it. You can already see the pneumobilia in the liver. There's our gallbladder again. You can see the connection between that and the duodenum. And in the bottom, in the pelvis, you'll start to see this uh, dense object again. So let's talk about gallstone disease. Uh, our patient there had what we call a gallstone ileus. Um, however, gallstone disease is uh, far more prevalent uh, then gallstone ileus, over 700,000 cholecystectomies are done every year. 20 million people uh, have gallstones, and uh, the health care cost of this is about uh, $6.5 billion every year. Um, so to discuss some of the uh, various gallbladder diseases we have, symptomatic cholelithiasis is uh, something we see commonly. This is where a gallstone temporarily obstructs the cystic duct and can cause pain, especially after eating, uh, and typically resolves. Biliary dyskinesia is where the gallbladder uh, has dysmotility and cannot contract well. You may or may not have gallstones associated with this. Uh, you often check this using a HIDA scan. And what this does, that's a nuclear medicine uh, tracer that is taken up in the liver and excreted into the biliary uh, tract. Uh, this is an example uh, where you can see the intrahepatic bile ducts, the common bile duct, the gallbladder listed here. Um, this will ultimately enter. Uh, into the duodenum. A diminished ejection fraction is typically considered uh, less than 30 percent. So talk about cholecystitis. There are various types of cholecystitis. Calculus cholecystitis is the one we're most uh, commonly see here. Uh, it typically, again, is a stone obstructing the cystic duct. Unlike symptomatic cholelithiasis, this usually persists. The pain persists, can lead to obstruction, and uh, distension and ischemia of the gallbladder, which is why this is a more urgent matter. There's acalculus cholecystitis, so no stones in the gallbladder. This is typically seen more in critically ill patients who have gallbladder stasis and have had an ischemic event to their gallbladder. There's reactive cholecystitis. We see this a lot in patients with hepatitis. There seems to be a rash of that right now, and the uh, local inflammation in the area uh, with the liver or other structures can cause the gallbladder to have a, a reactive uh, inflammation itself. Um, of note, there's also not cholecystitis. Uh, we commonly get consulted for patients in the ER who happen to have a gallstone regardless of their reason for arriving here. So one of the more interesting uh, biliary diseases is uh, Maritzi syndrome. 
So this is where a stone in the infant dibulum or the cystic duct uh, can compress uh, the common bile duct. It can sometimes just compress it and present like cholelithiasis. It may erode into the biliary uh, duct as well. Uh, these patients will present uh, sometimes with obstructive jaundice and then right upper quadrant pain, fevers, hyperbilirubinemia from the obstruction of the duct, elevated liver function tests. The uh, gold standard uh, imaging diagnosis for this is an ERCP, which will allow you to uh, more thoroughly evaluate the biliary uh, tree. However, you can um, make this diagnosis on other imaging, such as ultrasound, CT, uh, MRI. Depending on the extent of the compression versus erosion into the common bile duct, uh, it, various treatment options such as cholecystectomy, removing the stone uh, without all the uh, gallbladder. If there is a small fistula or if there's an extensive fistula, then you may need uh, reconstruction um, and a biliary enteric anastomosis. Another interesting uh, biliary disease is Bouveret syndrome. So similar to a gallstone ileus, it is a variation. This is where the gallstone uh, presents with a gastric outlet obstruction. Typically, you'll have either a cholecystoduodenal fistula or a cholecystogastric fistula. And the stone in this situation is lodged typically in the duodenum or uh, pre-pyloric. Uh, Again, patients nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. But on imaging, you'll see a stone um, in the duodenum typically in a very dilated stomach. Uh, usually, the surgery for this is uh, an enterotomy uh, with removal of the stone. Endoscopic measures can be used, uh, more uh, useful in these as the scope can get to them a little bit easier than in the small bowel. Um, however, these have uh, limited success rates and may ultimately require operative intervention regardless. Uh, so classical gallstone alias, more like what our patient had. So it is uh, rather uncommon, but it is something we do see. Approximately three in a thousand patients that have gallstones may present with this. Uh, less than one in a thousand uh, obstructions will be a result of this, and that's you know, small bowel obstructions. Typically, these are elderly patients in their 70s, 80s, multiple comorbidities, usually not healthy people. More commonly seen in females, they usually have a stone that's greater than two centimeters, which makes sense because it needs to be able to get stuck. But the average size is about four centimeters. The most common place that these stones will lodge is in the distal ileum. Uh, next most common would be the jejunum and stomach. And you may see them in a colon if for some reason there is a, an additional stricture. If somebody has had diverticulitis, uh, it may be lodged in a stricture at, at that site in the colon. So how do these people do? Uh, before the, in the 1920s uh, and earlier, the uh, mortality was pretty severe with gallstone ileus, uh, over 60% mortality. Uh, over time, in the 1960s to 2000s, the mortality rate uh, improved, uh, still higher than we'd like, um, but upwards of you know, 30%. <coughs> Currently, the mortality is about 5 to 13%, recognizing that these are still uh, usually unhealthy people. Improvements in mortality have uh, been attributed to both improvements of imaging, new imaging modalities, and the uh, liberalization of people receiving imaging, giving us better uh, diagnostic uh, capabilities of these patients. So how do you get um, a gallstone ileus? Again, it's an uncommon cause of an obstruction. You have to have a biliary enteric fistula, typically. So if the gallbladder gets inflamed, you usually have to have cholecystitis prior to this, uh, whether the patient knows it or not. The inflammation in the gallbladder leads to adhesions, uh, in, typically in the duodenum. A stone uh, exerts a pressure, which causes a necrosis between the two, and that fistula tracks to develop. And then the stone uh, ultimately will fall into the bowel and be lodged uh, somewhere uh, distal. These can be seen after a sphincterotomy if there's a, a large enough defect uh, in the sphincter that a stone can pass through and get lodged that can be seen from time to time. So typically these patients present with signs of small bowel obstruction, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, distension. They may in their history have what they call a tumbling obstruction where they'll have a small bout of obstructive symptoms, it'll improve, they'll have it again, it'll improve, they'll have it again as the stone uh, periodically is getting uh, moved down uh, stream uh, distal in their bowel. Uh, like I said, the patients may have cholecystitis, but it's not uncommon for these patients to not know that they have had cholecystitis and not present 
uh, with uh, right upper quadrant pain um, similar to our patient. So how do you diagnose it? Um, imaging is the primary modality for this. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you can get an x-ray such as you see here uh, where you can see pneumobilia in the liver and a calcified mass in the right lower quadrant. That would be the classic presentation. You can see the dilated bowel as well. Uh, CT is the, probably the best modality for examining this. It gives you a better idea of where specifically in the bowel that stone would be. And uh, if you use ultrasound, you may see additional uh, gallbladder wall, wall thickening, sometimes on C, that can increase your suspicion this patient had had an episode of cholecystitis as well. So how do we treat them? First thing is resuscitation. This is typically not an emergency. Uh, by far the most uh, common thing we do to, is to remove the gallstone uh, through an enterotomy. There are a few ways of doing this. You can do a single procedure where you do the enterotomy alone, if you do that, their recurrence rate is anywhere between 5 to 30 percent in the literature, um, and half of those recurrences will be in the first six months. Also in the first six months, um, if you don't do anything about the fistula, about half of them will close. You can do a single stage where you do both the enterotomy stone removal and you take the fistula down. This is typically done in healthier patients as uh, this procedure is associated with a higher morbidity and mortality. There's a two-stage where you do the single uh, enterotomy and stone extraction, and under a delayed elective basis, uh, you can come back and do the fistula closer. There is documentation. Some people are doing these laparoscopically. Uh, however, there's a, a reasonably high conversion rate to an open procedure uh, when attempting these. Endoscopic uh, measures can be used depending on where the stone is. Again, like in uh, Bouveret syndrome, if it's gastric duodenal, you may be able to reach it better with a, a scope or in a colon obstruction, you may be able to reach that with a scope. So should we perform the fistula closure? This is really the, the question that uh, presented. Prior to the 1960s, the answer was no, we don't do that. The, the mortality was high, as you saw, 60% of these patients that even presented had uh, mortality. In the 1960s to 2000s, the, there was a paradigm shift and we were closing the fistulas. The argument for this was that you want to reduce cholangitis rates. You have an open uh, tract between the enteric system and the biliary tree. What if patients have gallbladder cancer that's causing this? You don't want to miss that. And uh, they're far more likely to recur if you leave the fistula than if you don't. So where are we now? So really in the last 25 years, there's only two major uh, papers on this topic. Uh, Reisner and Cohen looked at 1,001 reported cases they could find in 1994 and they found that patients who underwent a single stage procedure, meaning the enterotomy stone extraction alone had, excuse me, uh, the single stage where they did that with the fistula takedown had a 17% mortality. If they underwent enterotomy and stone extraction alone, uh, the mortality was reduced to 12% with only a 5% recurrence in their study. Moving on to 2014, this is uh, probably the best study we have uh, on this topic. Uh, this group, uh, looked at the nationwide inpatient sample database as uh, the largest all-payer inpatient care database in the United States had over th uh, three and a half million bowel obstructions they looked at um, over a course uh, from 2004 to 2009 and they looked uh, specifically in these bowel obstructions they found that again less than one in a thousand were due to gallstone alias about 25 to 75 percent had had some history of having gallstones and nearly all of these patients had multiple comorbidities. The evaluation uh, they looked at was in the common treatments for these, separated into four groups. Uh, there were the people who went enterotomy stone extraction alone without fistula takedown. Uh, they had that enterotomy fistula closure uh, combination, the uh, single stage procedure. Patients who underwent bowel resection uh, for this and patients who underwent bowel resection and fistula closure. So the mean length of stay uh, for all comers was about 12 days. Uh, some of the common morbidities are not surprising, um, AKI, UTI, ileus, uh, nastomotic leak, and wound infections. Uh, about 40% of these patients were uh, able to be discharged home despite their multiple comorbidities, 50% or excuse me, 15% additionally with home health and about 30% to skilled nursing facilities. So here's a breakdown of the groups. As you can see, uh, they had a little under uh, 3,300 patients uh, 
62% underwent enterotomy with stone extraction without fistula with a 5% mortality rate. Those who went enterotomy, stone extraction, and fistula closure had a 7% mortality rate. Uh, patients who went, underwent bowel resection without fistula closure had a 13% mortality rate. And those bowel resection with fistula closure had a 7%. If you see at the bottom, these are the costs associated, the average costs associated with the total hospital stay of these patients. So not only was the mortality decreased in the patients who underwent enterotomy and stone extraction alone, but their overall cost of stay was reduced as well. They also looked at a subgroup, the patients who underwent delayed elective fistula closure with cholecystectomy. So this would be the two-stage approach. These patients were younger. They had a mean age of 60, so younger than the 70 to 80 year olds that were traditionally seen. Fewer comorbidities, so they're healthier. No surprisingly, uh, their mortality was reduced at 3%. They averaged eight days in the hospital and had an uh, average hospital charge of a little over $46,000. So when looking at the article overall, basically, official closure, if you chose to do that, would likely have a higher mortality rate, an increased length of stay. It would cost more uh, for the patient and the healthcare system. However, in patients who are particularly healthy, uh, there is an argument to undergo uh, delayed uh, elective closure of that fistula down the road. So our patient, what do we do with him? We admitted him for resuscitation. He had had nausea um, and pain for about five days. He, he was fluid behind, needed to be resuscitated, and we opted uh, based on our literature review to do a uh, interlithotomy, a single um, interotomy and stone extraction. So this is our patient open. We made a small uh, midline uh, laparotomy. We were able to uh, get the small bowel out and we found our stone uh, about uh, 10 centimeters from the uh, distal, uh, from the terminal ileum. We brought it back to 30 uh, to get it out. We made an interotomy, extracted the stone, and close it back together primarily there. Uh, this is our stone, about four and a half centimeters in size, which is about average for a gallstone ileus. So how do you do afterward? Uh, he went back to the floor. He had a post-operative ileus, which we learned uh, we were supposed to expect. Uh, he had return of bowel function on post-op day 10, was ultimately discharged on post-op day 12. So after reviewing the literature, seeing our patient, what did we learn about gallstone ileus? So it's uncommon cause of bowel obstruction. It has less than 1% of bowel obstructions and a pretty uncommon uh, finding in patients with cholecystitis as well. It does not have to, uh, the patient does not have to present with cholecystitis. Like our patient, he did not realize he'd ever had cholecystitis. And many of these patients do not. Usually in the elderly with many comorbidities, so you want to reduce the amount you're doing to these patients and taking the fistula down may not be the best idea. So segueing into our treatment, best procedure, lowest mortality, lowest cost for these patients is to do a single enterotomy and stone extraction. The two-stage procedure with a where you do the enterotomy stone extraction and delayed fistula takedown may be appropriate in selected particularly healthy individuals. And these patients are going to have a prolonged uh, post-operative ileus. So in these patients, you may want to consider things such as TPN, um, especially if they're coming in with a few days of dehydration, limited PO intake, and they may uh, have prolonged inability to take PO. Any questions? This patient had had the inguinal hernia repair. Any other abdominal surgery? No, sir. Okay. Was he diabetic? No, sir. No, no. Uh, he his blood sugar was fine on arrival, and he had no history. It was not an adult onset diabetic. No, sir. Okay. Question, comment. Uh, that was very well done. Can you go back to your slide, the plain film, the, you know, the plain film that had gallstone ileus on it? I had one question about that. What does that say at the bottom? Uh, that says uh, gallstone ileus pre lithotripsy. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the history of lithotripsy? What they tried on that? Why it didn't work? Or why why aren't we using it? Um, I don't know the specific history on it. I do know that it is occasionally used uh, in an attempt to break up the stones. Uh, I believe my understanding is they get that from the nephrology literature, that if it worked in kidney stones, why couldn't we try it in, in gallstones? Uh, but it's not commonly used. 
Nice job. Uh, can you go to the slide with the uh, four different groups and the outcomes on it? Uh, yeah, so are there p-values for those mortalities? Because that doesn't seem like a big difference between the enterolithotomy and the enterolithotomy with fistula closure. Um, I have to go back and uh, look at the p-values on that. I don't remember them off the top, top of my head. I want to say that they were significant, uh, but I, I can't say that for a fact. It looks like a small difference to me, and I mean, I haven't seen a whole lot of these. I've seen several, and I always dreaded the idea of taking the fistula down, but the ones I've encountered, it was surprisingly simple. And I agree that somebody from a nursing home that's got a bunch of comorbidities and congestive heart failure, et cetera, uh, you wouldn't want to prolong this operation, particularly with the anticipated post-op recovery anyways. But in a younger, healthy patient, and you do see this in younger, healthy people, uh, I the, the ones I've seen, the fistula takedown has been a relatively simple affair. And so I wouldn't shy away from that necessarily. I agree with that. You know, I think that, because uh, I've also seen them recur. When, they, when you have a recurrence a year or two later, it's really bad. Question? Uh, could you, I think it's the next slide. Um, the hospital charge for this uh, this group of younger patients is this the interval cost for coming back for the takedown, or is this they're so much healthier that their length of stay is shorter and all of that? Uh, so this would be the cost uh, for the delayed closure stay. So if you were to lump this together um, com relative to uh, the single stage procedure, it would be the seventy two thousand uh, plus the forty six thousand relative to the ninety one thousand. By the way, I <clears throat> particularly appreciate you bringing those uh, those points up because we increasingly need to look at these things, whether you're going into internal medicine or whatever, for the benefit of our medical students because there is a it's, it's significant to healthcare. Uh, several of you have heard this story before, but I want to tell you again when you think about your oral boards residents, and that is this patient had a virgin abdomen with a bowel obstruction. And so this case, if it were presented to you at, uh, at, on your oral boards, the CT scanner would have been broken down. And you would not have had anything but plain films, and that would be a virgin abdomen with a, with a small bowel obstruction. And the story is that I was a guest examiner on the boards. Um, and Ward Griffin was the executive director of the boards. And as an examiner on the boards, if you look ahead to the people that you're going to interview, if you know them or have had any experience with them, then you're supposed to change that day and not examine them. And so the first two days, <clears throat> I, at least one, if not two, of the people that we were examining had been here as students or something, and so I had to have them change the schedule that day, which really irritated Dr. Griffin, even though he and I were good friends. And so the third day, I looked ahead and saw this name that I recognized because this was a resident from Memphis and had been the chief resident there, which was a big deal, and had gone into practice with a friend of mine, but I did not know him. I just knew about him. Met him one time, just said hello. So I decided I wouldn't say anything about it because this guy was going to be a slam dunk to pass his boards. No, no way this couldn't happen, you know. So everything was going to be fine. So I didn't tell anybody until right before we were going to examine him and Laser Greenfield, I was examining with him, Dr. Greenfield of the Greenfield Filter. And I said, well, I've met this guy now. I want to tell you that, but I've heard he's great, you know, and there's, I don't think there'll be any problem. And so my question to him was essential, was a gallstone ileus without a CT scan in a virgin abdomen. And I could not get him to operate on that patient. Gave him everything I could, and he would not operate on the patient. So finally I just go on to the next question. Well, he failed our room because of the question that I had, and this was a really good friend of mine's partner. Now, fortunately, there are three rooms, and he passed the other two rooms, and so as a result of that, he passed his boards, but could have easily happened because of the gallstone ileus. So, 
uh, and it was <clears throat> it was a straightforward. The history was almost ident identical to your patient here. Uh, so remember, a virgin abdomen with small bowel obstruction it, it needs a surgeon to correct it at some point. Now, I might not have to do it right then, but you're going to have to. And anybody disagree? Have we changed anything in surgery enough to change that? So just remember that case. Uh, by the way, I had a great aunt who died of gallstone ileus at another hospital here. The first six months I was here because she didn't get aggressive enough treatment. Uh, because they were waiting because she was, quote, too sick to operate on, which, you know, most of us don't accept that. Now, go to your Marizzi syndrome. Picture this, the picture of it there. Now, just a brief comment about this. Uh, John Turner, last down, if you would. You can see there in the blow-up uh, cartoon how that could easily necrose the common duct. And so the, the point about this is that this is why... You know, as a surgeon, you don't just learn how to take out a gallbladder. You have to be prepared to be able to do cholidoco, jejunostomy, cholidoco, do it an ostomy or something like that. You've got to be trained adequately to do that, to be adequately trained as a surgeon, in my view. And so you can just, that's a pretty good picture right there, demonstrating how that can easily happen because, once again, Almost all of us have seen this happen, and, and that is a very complex procedure to do with a lot of in, inflammatory change. Prior to CT scanning and a lot of the things that we have now, um, Marizzi's was a fairly common diagnosis that you made without necessarily knowing it. And actually what you'd find is if you had people who had a bilirubin of less than five, very often Marizzi's syndrome was the reason for it. Marizzi syndrome, as originally described, I think everybody probably knows, was not really from gallstone disease, but was from metastatic cancer, but uh, with nodes obstructing the duct. But anyway, so that's a real nice picture. Very good job. Thank you. We'll go on to our next case, Marizzi? Kevin. Who was Marizzi, do you know? Uh, I do not know his backstory. Argentinian surgeon. And there's actually three stages. There's just a compression, there's a fistula, and then there's a fistula with greater than 50 percent involvement of the circumference of the uh, bile duct. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Harrell. I'm also a fourth year resident. And I'm excited to share with you a fun and interesting case that I participated in while on the pediatric surgery service. My faculty for this case is Dr. Bhattacharya, uh, but he regrets that he can't be here with us this morning. My presentation today will involve a brief case presentation. We'll review the history of this entity that I'm discussing, a review of the current literature, surgical management, our patient's hospital course, and of course, finishing with the cost of medicine. Our patient is a 16-year-old female. She presented to the emergency room with vague complaints of dizziness, fatigue, and weight loss. On further uh, uh, history taking, she has a history of autism, and the patient's mother reported that she had been pulling her hair and eating it since about kindergarten. Again, she's now at age 16. She did report some decreased appetite overall, which I think uh, led to her chief complaints of fatigue and weight loss. But she was essentially eating normally. She told us that she had had four waffles on the morning of presentation. And uh, digging into the hair pulling a little bit deeper, the, the family said that she had been doing this and they just hadn't been able to find a, quote, adequate therapist and had just sort of allowed it to continue unabated for over a decade. Uh, she was on Prozac at the time, I think mostly due to her autism. And on physical exam, she had a flat abdomen, but you could uh, obviously feel a firm, a large palpable mass that extended through most of the abdomen. So as they do, of course, the ER immediately obtained a CT scan, and we'll take a look at that um, now. Obviously, right away, you can see a large collection of what we assume to be foreign material in the stomach. And this continues all the way down to the pylorus. and meets in the middle. 
the coronal views here uh, are maybe my favorite. You can see again a massively distended stomach extending almost into the patient's pelvis full of uh, foreign material. And of course, this was read as a large gastric bezoar. So in case you didn't pick up on the abnormalities here, um, here in both views uh, is, again, large gastric bezoar. So I wanted to go through a history of bezoars because I think it's actually really fascinating. So in, in the, the ancient history, uh, these have been considered an antidote to any poison. And these were uh, mostly stones that are found in the digestive tracts of animals, sheep, goats, cows, that sort of thing. Uh, and the word bezoar actually comes from a Persian word that means antidote. And these were highly valued items, uh, selling for large sums of money. And uh, they actually used to make jewelry and little trinkets out of the stones found in the, the tracks of animals. And then again, they were used as medicinal items. This was first described by the Arab physician Avenzor, who I'd never heard of, but is a fairly interesting character. Um, and he was the first to describe this as a medicinal item, though I'm not sure why he thought that was the case or where that actually came from. But this belief persisted for centuries. And actually, it, uh, one of the first scientific tests was con conducted by the famous um, barber surgeon Ambroise Paré, who was a French surgeon in the 1500s. And uh, actually, if you're familiar with the Legends of Surgery podcast, if you're not, I would highly recommend it. They uh, release an episode every few weeks about some of the, the um, seminal figures of surgical history. And the one this week was actually about Ambroise Paré. Um, and he's famous for many things, uh, not least of which was bringing surgery out of the barber surgeon days into uh, really a, a scientific field of its own um, to compete with uh, the, quote, physicians, the medicine doctors of the day. And mostly that was due to his inability to speak Latin. He wrote all his papers in the vernacular French, and it brought it uh, to the masses and really elevated it out of the barber surgeon days. His other big contribution is using ligatures to tie off uh, vessels and amputations on the battlefield rather than just cauterizing it with hot oil, as was the common practice of the time. But specifically for bezoars, he was one of the first uh, people to scientifically test it. The French kings, uh, his personal chef at the time, was caught stealing silver and was thus sentenced to hanging. But they decided to conduct a little experiment on him instead, and they decided that the cook would be poisoned. And so uh, Dr. Paré uh, allowed the cook to be poisoned and then gave him a bezoar to test its, uh, its uh, efficacy. And of course, the cook died a very painful death about seven hours later. And thus, they determined that bezoars were not, in fact, good for all poisons. <laughs> this is a picture that's hanging in the small library up in the office. I think there are several of them uh, about uh, figures of surgical history. But Ambrose Paré is one of those. And I just thought that was interesting as I was preparing this talk. A few other points of history. There's a famous uh, English court case that involved uh, a lawsuit for trying to return a faulty bezoar. Again, I'm not really sure what the situation was, how they determined that it was faulty or, again, the, the, the details are lost to history. Uh, but uh, somebody paid 100 pounds in 1607, which I did the math, or I did the conversion. Uh, Adjusted for inflation, that's over 30,000 US dollars today. Um, but it was really interesting reading about the case. I guess the seller only told them that it was a bezoar or that it would cure poison, but didn't actually guarantee some sort of warranty. And so this case settled in favor of the seller. And they said that this set back consumer protection law for many hundreds of years in uh, England because of this faulty bezoar. Um, in 1883, uh, there's the first uh, surgical remover of a trichobezoar, which we're going to define those terms in just a few minutes. Um, and then to people of my generation, uh, bezoars are uh, more uh, famous in the modern era for being part of the Harry Potter novels. So bezoars uh, come in many flavors and varieties. In children, often we see what's called a lactobezoar, which is inspissated milk protein. And uh, there's a representative plain film there. You can have pharmacobezoars, which are a large collection of pills. Those are typically found uh, in the stomach as well. Phytobezoars, which are undigested keratin and plant material. And then a, a subset of that is called a diospyrobezoar, which is, comes from uh, overconsumption of unripe persimmons. And those are due to high levels of tannins. I didn't even know what a persimmon was, but that's what they look like. Um, so don't eat them if they're not ripe. <laughs> 
And then last, of course, is a trichobezoar, which is what we're going to be dealing with here, and that's undigested hair. Risk factors for bezoar development include prior gastric surgery or gastric dysmotility, and then there's also some literature about high fiber diets, especially with rapid ingestion and uh, poor uh, mastication of the, the, uh, the plant material. So treatment comes in three varieties. First would be enzymatic dilution. We're going to talk about those specifics. There's some literature promoting endoscopic treatment, and then of course surgery uh, as we pursued in our patient. Oops, sorry. So there's a surprising amount of literature about using Coca-Cola to dissolve uh, gastric phytobezoar specifically. And I think some of us are familiar with this using uh, Coke to, to unclog Dobhoff tubes in the ICU. I think many of us have done that. Uh, but there's a, a lot of different methods. This paper uh, presented on the screen is a meta-analysis looking at over 24 publications using Coca-Cola to dissolve phytobezoars. And there's not really a consensus on the method for that. Some people, uh, the one of the main studies that they looked at, they had the patients drink three liters of Coke, which seems like a whole lot to me. Uh, but they left it in there for 12 hours, and that had 50% complete resolution of phytobezoars. 41% uh, had near resolution, and that could be completed with endoscopy, and only 9% of those patients in that study ended up needing surgery. So I, in my view, why not give it a try, especially if you know it's a phytobezoar specifically of undigested plant material. To go along with it, there uh, are some case reports of using pancreatic enzymes as well as cellulase, um, specifically for the cellulose in undigested plant material. None of these methods have been shown to be useful for trichobezoars, again, which is undigested hair, which was our case. And then there are all sorts of concerns about causing ulcers, electrolyte disturbances, pain, nausea, vomiting, allergic reactions, et cetera, with these enzymatic dilutions. This, uh, talking about endoscopic intervention, uh, there are many, again, many case reports about these sort of things. This is a large gastric phytobezoar, um, which you can see on the the right-hand side of the screen. This was actually causing a, a pressure necrosis ulcer, which you can see here on the stomach wall. And they use a, a, an endoscopic snare to pass multiple times and break up the phytobezoar. And then that was able to be washed through the digestive system uh, with complete resolution. Another interesting paper from China, they use an endoscopic lithotripsy device. I was trying to read about the specifics of this quote, mini explosive laser, which sounds awesome. I couldn't really figure out what exactly that meant, but essentially they insert it in there and they have these little controlled zaps of energy that break apart these phytobezoars. Um, and they've had extremely well, extremely good success. They had a series of 285 patients presented with 99.6% cure rates. I don't exactly know what kind of bezoars they were seeing. Again, I assume they're mostly phyto and probably pharmacobezoars, but it seems to be very effective. This is an interesting paper of a combination of endoscopic and enzymatic treatment where they actually uh, both had the patient drink and they used an endoscopic injection device to put Coca-Cola directly into the bezoar itself. And they had great success with that also in South Korea. Moving on to surgical intervention, uh, you have open exploration, laparoscopy, and combination procedures that typically are combined laparoscopic and endoscopic that have been described. Now, of course, the deciding factor for which avenue you're going to pursue as far as surgical treatment is going to depend on your patient factors, comorbidities, uh, where the bezoar is actually located, et cetera. So you have to use your, your doctor brain a little bit to sort of make an informed choice about what's going to happen and um, make sure that you're going to cure this patient and you're not going to leave some of the bezoar behind and causing a small bowel obstruction. So there are many case reports about large trichobezoars specifically. I don't want to upstage my own pictures, but um, you can see intraoperative pictures of open resection with a gastrotomy and the large trichobezoars being removed. Um, and here's another gastric outlet obstruction. People love to write about this. It's mostly in the international literature. I didn't see a lot of US-based case reports, but um, these are fun pictures. Here's an interesting technique paper from the Middle East where they actually used laparoscopy. Uh, they made a, a gastrotomy incision. Uh, you can see the bezoar here uh, inside the stomach lumen, and then they actually used an endo catch bag to uh, 
uh, in the stomach to snare the, the bezoar and they pulled it out, they closed the stomach with a single layer of 2 ovicryl and the patient did very well. So, Some other fun bezoar case reports that I found. Uh, this was a great title, Hidden Treasure in an Endoscopically Retrieved Trichobezoar. They actually found a gastrotomy tube, a gastrostomy tube inside the bezoar that I guess had been sucked in from the many years of hair collection. And then there, this is a case report of it actually causing pancreatitis. So I think it's not, you, you don't necessarily just have functional complications from these entities, but you can actually have medical problems and even find hidden treasure. This was a fantastic paper. If you're looking to read a little bit more about this topic, um, a, a review paper of, of the current literature uh, with a, an excellent uh, diagram of uh, an algorithm for the treatment. And they recommend if you have a gastric bezoar attempting endoscopic removal uh, using the fragmentation procedures that I've already described, maybe uh, ad adding chemical or enzymatic to solution, and then proceeding to surgery if that fails. If it's intestinal, you can try laparoscopy and then proceed to laparotomy. Um, they had an experience of nine patients where some of them were used. Um, uh, they used Coca-Cola in one patient, but most of those ended up moving on to laparotomy and requiring enterotomy. I also thought, given all of the recent issues going on with Erlanger, that I could propose that we change the name to the General Hospital of Drama, like this, patient, like this paper is from. So just a thought. Another entity that is uh, associated with this, with uh, Bezoar, is, is called Rapunzel syndrome, which hopefully you're all familiar with uh, the story of Rapunzel. But this was actually a New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Images in Clinical Medicine. You can have extension of the Bezoar all the way through the, the pylorus down through the duodenum in the small intestine. And just something to be aware of make sure, when you're pulling these out, make sure you're going to get it all. There were several reports that I looked at where they had to go back and reoperate uh, because they didn't realize that they had a whole string of hair left dangling into the, the small bowel. I wanted to define some of the psychological factors that are obviously associated specifically with trichobezoars um, and just define some of the terminology. So first would be trichotillomania, which is compulsive pulling of the hair. And you see patients with large bald spots. Um, about 20% of patients with trichotillomania will also have swallowing of hair, and that's called trichophagia, and that's compulsive hair eating. Obviously, those two mostly go together. I don't know where else you would get the hair to eat, but um, about 30% of, <laughs> sorry, about 30% of patients with trichophagia will end up developing <laughs> a trichobezoar. And I tried to find information about the combination of, sorry. <laughs> The combination of trichophagia associated with autism, but I, I couldn't find any links uh, to specifically go with our patient. And then pica, which a lot of people ask me about when I was telling them about this case, that's just eating items typically not thought of a food, as food, so I guess trichophagia would fit in with that, but that's technically considered a separate entity. And then psychological treatment includes, first of all, an accurate diagnosis. Every paper I looked at was very clear. This can be associated with obsessive compulsive tendencies. Uh, and the spectrum of obsessive compulsive disorders, but um, you, you want to make sure that you're accurately diagnosing them. And then, of course, cognitive behavioral therapy to help change those behaviors. And there is some uh, literature supporting the use of tricyclic antidepressants uh, for these patients. So now moving on to our operative intervention. Uh, the pictures didn't come out as well as I would have liked, but just uh, to, this is, these, patient, these pictures are all taken standing on the patient's left. Um, so the, the head is generally oriented in this direction and the feet are generally oriented in this direction. But this is Dr. Bhattacharya uh, removing the specimen from the stomach. So we started with an upper midline incision. We made a transverse gastrotomy. We tried to make it as small as possible, but ended up having to extend our incision a good bit to, to get the, the large mass out. We ended up delivering the, the distal end of the bezoar first, and then we were able to slide the rest of it out. So here you can see, here's the mass of hair coming out of the stomach, a little bit closer up. Again, coming out. And then here's our specimen. There it is in one of the large blue buckets. And I was pretty excited about getting to participate in this case. Uh, the pathology return that this the specimen was 1.7 kilograms, which was larger than many of the patients we took care of on the pediatric surgery service. It was 39 by 11 by 10 centimeters. Uh, we closed the stomach uh, with the interrupted 3O PDS, and then we imbricated the suture line with a 3O silk, and we actually tacked omenum along 
sort of in a grand patch fashion just to ensure that we had um, a good closure. It was a fairly difficult closure because the stomach was uh, so dilated and really thickened that we had difficulty embricating it. Um, and, but the patient, as we're going to see, ended up doing very well. So the hospital course, uh, post-operatively, of course, we left a, a, a nasogastric tube for decompression. We did a two-day course of Zosin. Maybe there weren't s significant indications for antibiotic uh, usage in this patient, but if you had smelled and seen the things that came out of this gastric bezoar, you would have put the patient on antibiotics as well. <laughs> it was very foul. Um, she did have a delayed return of bowel function. We ended up starting TPN on about post-operative day six. On day eight, her NG tube was clamped and came out. Uh, that was mostly based on the, the quantity and quality of the NG tube output. It was dark for the first week or so and then uh, cleared up and the output dropped off significantly. We started a clear liquid diet on day nine, day 10 regular diet, and the patient was discharged home on postoperative day 11. And following up with Dr. Bhattacharya in the office, she's been doing well tolerating a regular diet. We, of course, referred her to appropriate um, psychological and psychiatric counseling after this to prevent a recurrence of this entity. Now, in anticipation of questions at the end of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about the literature support for doing a routine upper gastrointestinal series after stomach repair. And I was surprised at, honestly, how literal literature I could find uh, about this. All of the, except for one, all the papers I could find come from the bariatric literature. And as with many things, I think you can find papers to support your own biases. But this is uh, one paper that looked at 804 patients using selective uh, versus routine upper GI series after laparoscopic gastric bypass. They had no differences in leak rates or time of diagnosis to leak. And another paper looking at similar things, they looked at over 2,000 patients, but only had eight leaks, which seems incredibly low. Um, and while I wasn't terribly impressed with their meth uh, methodology, um, they actually, sorry, in this paper found that radiologic leak uh, was more sensitive than any clinical features. But again, I, I, I'm not sure that that really bears out. One paper I was able to find uh, from 2017 that looks at uh, routine versus selective upper GI specifically for gastric or duodenal perforation, which I think is more relevant to, even though we didn't have a spontaneous perforation in this case, um, more relevant to what we do here in the general surgery world. And they also didn't find any differences between um, patients, the, the leaks or the reoperations in upper GI or uh, patients who did not undergo GI surgery. This was only 115 patients, and I think this could be an opportunity for future research with larger case studies because this is something we see pretty commonly, even in the era of PPIs. Uh, and specifically looking at uh, selective versus routine upper GI studying, they this was not statistically different, obviously, but I think 10% is a could be a large clinical difference. Uh, but again, they're using that very selectively. So, of course, we're going to finish with some cost of medicine. Something I learned uh, in this case in reviewing this was that single pack sutures like this are actually not billable individually to a patient. So this pack of three OPDS, like we used to close the stomach, costs the hospital two dollars and four cents, and I guess that gets lumped in with whatever incidental charge for operating room fees that they charge the patient. However, a pack of, I couldn't find a picture of uh, the actual pack with 3O, but uh, a pack of eight pops uh, cost the hospital $15, and they do charge those the patients for those individual packs of eight suture, and that costs them $24.64 for the patient. So thank you for letting me share this fun case, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments? Yes, Dr. Fisher? you were talking about is that some of these people have a gastric motility problem. Has anybody ever looked at doing uh, pyloroplasties on these types of people in conjunction with taking the bezoar out? And if you did, then you might want to place your incision on your stomach a little bit different so that you could somehow or another, or maybe you wouldn't. I mean, if you're going to take the bezoar out of a, you maybe want a proximal incision like you made and then the pyloroplasty distal. Anybody looked into that? I did not see anything in the literature uh, looking at specifically to re prevent recurrence. I think recurrence is fairly low in these patients. It takes a while for most of these to build up. Um, 
with the maybe exception of, I know I've heard some stories of patients shotgunning kale juice or eating whole broccoli or things like that, causing phytobezoars, but I didn't see anything. But that would be a consideration, absolutely, in placing your stomach incision. I had one of these as a resident, and I, I remember looking up the literature on it, and it seems to me that a lot of these patients come out of, of hospitals that take care of people with Mental health hospitals. Mental health hospitals. Absolutely. And, and that kind of thing. And that's where my patient came from. And, and so, you know, you're dealing with that kind of pathology. So, the other thing is, though, he, he made mention in, in, in the, uh, the closure, and I guess, I guess that would be probably be problematic in terms of any kind of anastomosis because everyone I've ever seen had a pretty leathery type stomach or a very edematous stomach. And so you really worry about that. A gastric fistula, where we can get small bowel fistulas and colon fistulas and things like that to close on their own. Gastric fistulas are a real problem. Uh, they're, they can be lethal. In my experience, at least, they've been really difficult to get closed. So, but that, that's an interesting concept or thought. Uh, just hard to do if you've had to operate on. If you've had to operate on the bezoar is usually so large that doing any kind of pyloroplasty would have been probably pretty difficult to do. I would think. Dr. Greer? I just had a question for you. It's interesting, two vascular guys are asking about these questions. But I uh, remember having patients with ileostomies who would binge on grapefruit and oranges and come in with a partial small bowel obstruction. You didn't mention any other factors which would be more common than some of these bezoars, but did you read about distal small bowel obstructions in patients with ileostomies? I didn't see anything about that specifically, no, sir. I'll, I, I had some experience with it. I don't know if anybody up. else has, but. Pineapple. Where it become essentially a bezoar in the small bowel. <clears throat> I think there's a little bit of stricture right there as it comes through the fascia, and that's where it gets caught. Yes, and you tell them quit eating, you know, 15 oranges in a day and that kind of thing. And yeah. yeah I had a lady that I think ate 15 tamales and didn't take the wrappers off. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder how Joey Chestnut does all That's this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Joey, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned pica. Uh, tell, what more did you read about pica? Do you know much about that? I I didn't read a whole lot more about that, but just well, uh, uh, again, this lived too long, I guess. <laughs> but. Uh, there, it, there's a there's a culture of pica eaters in Missis in the Mississippi Delta and West Tennessee, and uh, one of the more dramatic cases that I saw of this was actually a young woman <clears throat> in her early 20s <clears throat> who had come to Mississippi to visit with her relatives, and they were pica eaters. Uh, and she came in with a bowel obstruction and ultimate, and, and actually had perforated and had peritonitis. So we did, talking about x-rays, we decided to get a plain film of the abdomen, which in the emergency room was the only thing you could get, and it looked like she'd had a barium enema because she'd been eating clay. Uh, they actually have clay banks in, uh, in Mississippi that, uh, and this is real common, again, out in the rural areas, uh, where they thought they had special nutrient values and this she had come from Detroit to visit with her family to also indulge on pica eating. Um, and so, so it's, a, it's a pretty graphic thing when, when you've eaten clay because it's very difficult to get that out. Uh, uh, I can't even remember now exactly what we did, but I know we closed. We, we say uh, she lived, but uh, it, was, it was touch and go there for a while over eating clay. So. So there are a number of different things I understand that people eat, uh, tree bark and all that sort of thing, uh, you know, but, uh, but, but clay is, is a very unusual one. Any other questions? Yes, Tyler? I was just going to say the other sorts of hair is Barbie dolls. We've had at yeah, least one patient that came in and ate all the hair off their Barbie dolls and had done that for years and was obstructed from so that. So there is another source of hair. Right? <laughs> Well, I got to say, I don't know how you can present these two problems any better than you've seen done today. These are beautiful cases, both of you guys. Thank you very much. Well done.